Barnett ends by asking the reader who they think it was. It's a fun conclusion to the series. This is all told in rhyming text and is great fun <clears throat> because it, it all has different animals. The first one, as you can see here, are the cows with a spaceship, but the rest of the animals have other things. And the rhyming text goes like, I'll love you till the cows home, come home. And the next two page spread is, I'll love you till the yaks come back. On to, I'll love you to, till the sheep set sail. And I'll love you till the ants march in. There are eight verses and the last one breaks the pattern and all of it offers silly fun full of love. Whoops. A colorful, wonderful romp of possibilities, mostly with rhymes. It opens with, tomorrow most likely there will be a sky and chances are it will be blue. Set next page, tomorrow most likely there will be a squirrel and chances are his name is Stu. Listeners can make up their own tomorrows and chances are after hearing the story. And also, it's kind of a going to bed book without the focus on actually going to bed. It's rather about thinking of tomorrow. This one is great fun. You'd think this would be a short book, but no, rules are kind of complicated. The animals explain that there are, quote, most definitely are, 10 very specific, tried and true, and absolutely essential rules for the making of a birthday wish, end quote. However, each rule does have a few exceptions. For example, rule two says you must have a party. And under that rule is, you should have balloons, quote, unless you are a rhinoceros, a swordfish, or a sea urchin, close quote, in which case you may choose to skip the balloons. It's silly fun kids will enjoy all surrounding the most wonderful day of the year for the kids. The stylized tree that monkey lives in has branches that stretch out from the center to the edges. At the top, straight up is a little hole and out comes a small yellow creature that entices monkey to play. Quote, I bet you can't catch a minute, it says as it begins its way around the tree. Once all of the yellow creatures are finished going around the tree, that they are each a minute and that so once they've all gone around the tree, that's been one hour. They leave and a new group, this time of green creatures arrives. It's a great title to reinforce learning the concept of time with minutes and hours and the, the analog clock instead of the digital clock. This is a very simple story of a group of five elephants who march in line from here to there, always in the same order. They go up, down, over, under, and more. But at day's end, they are tired. But before they sleep, they all lift their trunks up in the air and trumpet, scattering stars across the sky. It's fun to look at the elephants each on the pages because they they always are in the same order. And no, I did not find any elephant that was exactly like any other elephant in the book. This is an encouragement to children to make something, whatever they are interested in, from art to music, a snack to share with a friend, join your community and make a pledge to help, build a wall for a play tower in the park, and make a difference. It's a positive, upbeat message that kids can be creative and can act to help with their, within their community's goals. Kids are curious, as we all know, and in this book, this will answer one of the questions that kids might have about a hijab. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. I should have checked on that. In rhyming text, a girl talks about her different family members and what they look like in their own homes when they're not wearing their hijabs. She also talks about how each woman has one that fits her personality. For example, her grandmother wears a hijab that clasps under her chin and is carefully folded, and her aunt wears a silky one with a handmade jewel. And her aunt's hair is streaked with pink and purple, which we don't know until they're in her home. It's a recognition of women being their own persons and setting up an example for the girl telling the story. Very upbeat and positive. A young giraffe plays hide and seek with her older brother. When looking for him, she asks different animals if they have seen him, giving one characteristic of her brother to each of the different animals. And each animal replies that she has that characteristic too. She's tall. She has lots of spots and she's fast. And she begins to see that she does have those characteristics just in time to confront a leopard that has been stalking her. And you can see the leopard over there. I don't know if you can see my, right here. He's right there. 
Young listeners will see her older brother following her and hiding to be sure that she is safe all the time she's looking for him. It's delightful with beautiful illustrations. Loving parents invite their young daughter to put her hands up for a hug, to celebrate, to get dressed, to play peekaboo, for high fives, and many other fun and loving ways to hear these words instead of fearful, threatening ways. The author talked about how they wanted the kids to not have a negative reaction to those words. It is exuberant, colorful, and positive, and the story ends with a community march of people carrying positive signs. This is a sequel to the book Madeline, Madeline Finn and the Library Dog. And finally, she can adopt one of Bonnie's puppies. Bonnie's the dog she read to in book one. When she asks her owner, Mrs. Dimple, how she found Bonnie, she learns to shel about shelter animals and is soon organizing a day to read aloud to the shelter cats and dogs. Giving back is great. Another positive message. And lots of animals get adopted that day, just in case you're worried. This is um, one of the books I've read for, see, I'm already reading for next, not this summer, but next summer's summer reading program, Imagine Your Story. And that's about fairy tales, myths, and legends. So this is one that I thought would be fun to add to this list today. Gondra is a little dragon. Her mother is from the West and her father is from the East. Each parent has some attributes to, unique to him or her and some attributes that are the same, like they're big. Gondra has some attributes like her mother and some like her father. But the important thing is she's her own self and she is their treasure. Oh, this one's so fun. I really, you know, I thought I didn't like poetry when I was in junior high. I was wrong. I do like poetry. <laughs> Sylvia loves to write poetry. So on a spring day, she writes a lovely one and ties it to the birch tree in the park, a gift to the tree. The next morning, she finds a different poem tied to the tree, and she thinks it is a gift to her from the tree. Soon enough, she learns that a boy in her class, Walt, thinks the tree is his. They soon get past the ownership idea and begin sharing poems under the tree. Kirkus says, a sweet and quiet homage to friendship, nature, and the power of words and poetry. This would be a great title to encourage poetry among your listeners or readers in your cl class or library. Oh, yes, we have another David title. I almost missed this. It came out in August, but I didn't get a copy until December last year. Following the theme of the previous books, in this one, David continually bugs his big brother. And every time he does, he hears things like, no, David, you're too little. And grow up, David. Anyone with siblings will relate to both sides of this story. And it ends on a positive, upbeat note. This is a counting and reverse counting book that also celebrates diversity. And while it's, um, it's about sharing and playing together, really. So you, um, it starts with a boy going down the slide and it says, how to one, play by yourself. And then the story grows as one by one, child, each, another child joins on a different playground piece of equipment or in playing a game. So for two, it's a, a, the boy and a girl on a teeter-totter. And soon they're playing tag and other things. This, this book ends with, oh, it goes up to 10, and then the parents come and collect their kids to count back down to one. This ends with the original boy as a one who joins his mom to read a book with the final line, how to two. This is fun. Gargantua Jr.'s mom was apparently a little wild in her early days. And he, this is what he finds out when he locates some old newspaper articles. She kind of shoves them aside because nowadays she is busy protecting Earth from asteroids, the occasional attacking robot, and helps prop up buildings that were damaged. Gargantua Jr. wants to be just like mom. But when he tries to knock down a condemned building, mom arrives just in time to save him and suggests that they work together from now on. So they do. I don't know that any kid will have ever heard of Gargantua, but they won't care because this is a great book of monsters. This is a lovely book. There, there is a Navajo tradition 
of celebration in this title, the welcoming of a new baby to the extended family. Each family member tries to be the one to cause the baby's first laugh. Whoever does that, whichever person, they are the host of the child's first laugh ceremony. It's a wonderful look at new life, laughter, family, and community. Very positive. Oh, but on a not as positive note, here is the panda problem. This book's narrator is thrown when he says, the panda has a big problem. And the panda says, nope. A story has to have a problem to solve in order for it to be a story. So the narrator is really pushing this panda to come up with a problem. Do you, are, you, are you looking for a friend? No. Do you need this? No. So the panda decides that he will be the narrator's problem. And boy, does he do a good job of that. Kids will enjoy making up their own problem book after they hear this one. How wacky can it go? And see the aliens in the tree? Oh yeah, they show up in the book. <laughs> a young bossy rhino believes he can have all he wants whenever he wants it. Little rhino tosses warthog aside when he crosses his path and squashes baboon's banana when baboon refuses to share. One day, little rhino finds a mango tree with many mangoes all, all around it on the ground, but he will not share, again shouting, I'm in charge. He doesn't listen to Mouse's warning, and soon a stampede of wildebeest charge through, scaring little rhino. When Mouse asks him who is in charge, rhino says, not me. Listeners will love little rhino's comeuppance. I know that we've had plenty of how do dinosaurs do things, but this came out in um, June and I got it in August. And it's how do dinosaurs learn to read, so I really had to put it on the list. It follows the format of the previous books, first showing things that no one should do with books, and then saying how the dinosaurs are kind and careful with each book, how they practice reading words and ask to read just one more. Three pages in the back of the book explain some ways children and dinosaurs learn to read. So that's quite fun. Now we'll get to beginning readers. This is the first Pete the Kitty book that I've seen because kids want to learn more about when Pete was little. Little Pete does indeed have the hiccups. One by one, he asks his friends what they do to get rid of hiccups, but none of it works for him. Finally, his mom has the solution. And as you can see, this is an I can read book that is a shared my first reading. So that's the very, very beginning reading level. Spring at last with sunshine, leaves, and flowers. Flowers. Spike sneezes. Leaves. Spike sneezes. Blowing seeds. Whew. Spike sneezes. Then rain and puddles. Oh, will Spike sneeze again? <gasps> no, not with puddles. So that's that's the ending. There's no real solution to his sneezing, just that that's what happens. Here's the second book I've run across about Rappy, and it is again told in rap like the um, Rappy and the Martians. Rappy does not want to write a poem in school. He sounds kind of like I thought I was. Soon enough, he's rapping instead about many of the things he likes. Imagine his surprise when their teacher, Mrs. H, tells him that rapping is poetry, and the whole class joins in. That's great fun. Ark the Shark is a popular character, and this is the newest book I've seen about him. He's excited because tomorrow he will bring treats to school for Treat Tuesday. His mom is baking brownies, and he is telling everyone how yummy they will be. When he gets home, he sees a plate of brownies on the counter. His mom is out shopping and will be, will be home soon, but Clark has to try just one to make sure that it's as good as he remembers. Before he knows it, the plate is empty and mom is home and she is not happy. Clark bakes another batch of brownies with some help and he shares them with the class the next day. Danny and the dinosaur is still around because Bruce Hale's helping him uh, since Sid Hoff can no longer write them. This, in this one, they're, Danny and the dinosaur are outside the museum and they see a huge sign that says, meet the king. They realize if they are going to meet a king, they need to practice their manners. Throughout the museum, they are polite and considerate, even though they have a couple of accidents, and they receive compliments. Then they ask the museum director how they should address a king, because they're not quite sure what it should be. 
he tells them you should say, Your Majesty. But the King, king coming to the museum has been dead a long time. He's a mummy. It's King Tut. Well, that's a disappointment at first, but a mummy? A mummy is great. And so they think that everything's just fine. The farmer is away and never fear, Zoe the chicken is in charge of the baby lambs. She declares that herself because she knows everything. She tells her friend, Sam the pig, they need dinner and baths. After that, we put them to bed. Sam the pig helps, but a few things go wrong. Zoe tries to give the lambs pie for dinner and they really would rather eat the grass. Then the baths will be mud baths, so they're not getting any cleaner. They did have fun though. Dry off in the hay and then settle into the hay wagon to sleep, but only after Zoe, or, uh, Zoe reads them a, a few stories. Here's the second book in, um, in the Zip series. The first one was See Zip Zap. This one is about a bot. Zip tries a new magic trick and he zaps a bot. The problem is the bot does not want to do what Zip commands. His younger sibling Bip laughs when the bot throws a pie at Zip. After zapping one bot into two and two bots into four, Zip finally zaps tea in a pot so all can enjoy it. And this is once again told in brief rhyming phrases, a very beginning reader that uh, kids will feel a good success when they've completed that story. Here are some, oh, there's just one beginning reader nonfiction so far, but I, I think a couple more just came in the other day. This is a biography of Ben Franklin that hits the highlights of his life and leaves out any bad things we might know about him, such as his disagreements with his brother and um, in the back materials, they do mention his being a slave owner and that he became an abolitionist later in his life. And at the back of the book, there is additional information that includes a timeline, some of his inventions, and his interest in writing and printing. So it's, a, of course, a very brief look at his life. Some nonfiction picture books. This is a picture book length poem honoring the many well-known African-American people who were successful and or stood up for the rights of all. Beautiful illustrations by Kadir Nelson. Each person is identified at the back of the book in case you don't recognize them, because I didn't recognize everybody. And each is given one brief paragraph about his or her life. It's a celebration of African Americans and of humanity and a good starting point to, to find a person you might want to learn more about. A picture book biography of the woman who worked long and hard to convince Congress to pass laws to protect the wild horses and burros that lived on public lands. She enlisted the help of many children and others who cared about the treatment of the animals. A lesson in standing up for what you believe in and gathering others to the same cause and not giving up. This one's fun. Well, they're all fun, but this is a poem of animal sounds for two or more voices. It's great for performing out loud in the classroom or the library, and it's reminiscent of Joyful Noise, the Newberry winner from 1989. And the newer series, You Read to Me, I'll Read to You, that um, has each of the sides are in a different color. So if you're reading the left side of the page, it's going to be blue or something. And then if you're reading the right side of the page, then it's red. And then in between, it's purple, so you know you both read. And these are can be great fun for kids to read aloud. School Libraries Journal says this book is for grades one to five. I put it in the picture book category, but it could go for older kids too. It highlights a variety of frogs from around the world and gives general information about frogs' life cycles. Frogs lay eggs, frogs live in water more than land, etc. things like that. And then there is a list at the back of the book that provides the name, body length, diet, and range of each of the illustrated animals. It's a great browsing title on the subject. And there, there's no way he could do all of them. I think there's more than 5,000 kinds of frogs, I think it says in there, some number like that. The author asks the reader listener many questions, such as, could you drape like a lizard, gape like a lizard, do a push up like a lizard? And each, each question has a different lizard illustrated with the name of that lizard right underneath it. And there are, so there are many attributes that are noted and emphasized. Each question is, oh, I said that, sorry. 
It's great for lizard fans. And there is brief information on each lizard that was pictured at the back of the book. It's kind of become a, a traditional thing to do. Thank goodness, because more information is always welcome. Early chapter books. Okay, D this is book one of the Didi Dodo Future Spy series. It opens with an answering machine message saying Inspector Flytrap is not available due to a visit from his grandmother. Poor Coco Dodo needs help. His super secret fudge sauce has been stolen and it's time for the annual Queen's Royal Cookie Contest. Who can help? Didi Dodo. Future Spy is on the case. It is hilarious. There are silly antics everywhere, just like in Inspector Flytrap. They include traveling too fast via roller skates, escaping a herd of angry yaks, which that's hard to do, and sliding through the mall to get to the cookie contest. Fans of Infector, Inspector Flytrap will feel right at home. This is book one in the new series, The Questionnaires. As we know from the picture book, Rosie Revere Engineer, Rosie loves experimenting and inventing. Here, she and her friends, Ada Twist and Iggy Peck, are trying to solve a snake problem for her Uncle Fred. But in the meantime, her Aunt Rose takes her to meet the Blue River Riveters. They were airplane builders during World War II, and they need Rosie's help. We'll see if they can be helpful for these ladies. And on to book one about Frankie Sparks, third grade inventor is the name of the series. In this one, Frankie is enthusiastic about experiments and loves science and math. Her class, though, is going to get a pet and they will vote on which kind they want. Frankie is sure a rat is the best choice and keeps trying to convince her best friend to vote rat. But Maya wants to vote for a hermit crab and is beginning to feel that Frankie is not listening to her opinion. In the meantime, Frankie has to invent something that will allow the rat to be fed over the weekend when no one's there. There are some misunderstandings, but things come right in the end. It's a good start to the new series with science in the forefront. This contains four stories of Yasmin, her Pakistani-American family, and her school. She is in second grade and her imagination is her tool for solving problems. She is creative and stands confidently when challenged. The stories are titled Yasmin the Explorer, Yasmin the Painter, Yasmin the Builder, and Yasmin the Fashionista. The sequel, Yasmin in Charge, came out March 1st. I haven't seen it yet, but it also has four stories, so you might want to look into that one as well. This is book one in the Sarai series. She is in fourth grade and is a go-getter and a problem solver, but sometimes your best effort may not be enough. When her grandparents look like they will have to move, Sarai organizes lemonade sales and the chance to win a dance competition to try and earn some money for them. It's lively and upbeat, and this is a positive story of dealing with change and finding a different sol solution than expected. And Amazon stated, this is inspired by the life of viral video sensation and social activist Sarai Gonzalez with the help of award-winning children's book author Monica Brown. Well, I haven't seen her, her um, video series, but the books are very good. The second one is Sarai in the Spotlight. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. I should have looked that one up too. In this book, her best friend moved away unexpectedly, and now Sarai is a bit lost in the lunchroom. Then her teacher asks her to show the new girl, Christina, around the school. They are so different. Christina writes in a notebook at recess and is very shy, and Sarai's out in the middle of everything. However, maybe they do have some things in common. Making new friends can be challenging, but worth it. Ellie May in second grade is determined to be the flag leader on one of the four days left before President's Day holiday. She comes up with good plans, but her execution of each is faulty. Plus, and oh, she does get in trouble. Plus, her former friend no longer comes outside for recess, but stays in to study more. Why did, what did Ellie May do to make her mad? Ellie May on April's Fool's Day is book four. I haven't seen that one, but I'm assuming there'll be more holiday books in this series. Some fiction for grades two to five or so. Talk about hilarious. <laughs> well, it's by Mac Barnett. This is the first book in the Mac B Kid Spy series. One afternoon, the phone rang and Mac, yes, the Mac Barnett who wrote the book, he says this is a true story. I don't think so. He answered, it was the Queen of England asking him to find the stolen crown jewels. Now suddenly, he is a spy. 
This quirky, goofy, supposedly true story will appeal to readers of Wimpy Kid and similar titles, and there are lots of black and blue and yellow illustrations. Mac tries hard and does not give up even when things seem hopeless. Book two is out, The Impossible Crime, but I haven't seen it yet. Book three will be out in September. Frederick Fredrickson is in fifth grade. He is a flea in a school world of lions, gazelle, meerkats, and fleas that live on meerkats. Then he accidentally ends up at a disciplinary camp for boys in trouble, and he is mistaken for Dash Blackwood, the top troublemaker of the land. At first, he loves his power. Everyone respects him, but it begins to eat at him. He really doesn't like lying and misleading people. And he makes friends with his cabin, cabin mates who really are not bad. It is the arrival of a Category 5 hurricane that convinces Frederick to shine. Humorous, incredible, and satisfying. This is another book that I'll have for next summer because it's about, this is about um, myth, mythological creatures. Um, they're the Greek ones. So Nico, Nico Bravo, Lula, a sphinx, and Buck, a unicorn, work at Vulcan Celestial Spy Shop, and they know their stuff. But a new customer turns everything upside down. She is Aeowulf, a descendant of Beowulf, and she plans to say, slay, slay Cerberus because he is a monster. If she does, everyone in Hades can leave the underworld and come to the land of the living. There could be a zombie apocalypse, but she's not listening. Nico and her friends are going to try to stop her, and they do run into some trouble. Oh, it's, I don't know if I said this, it's a full color graphic novel. And I, there's obviously going to be more. This got the Coretta Scott King Author Honor Award. Langston, named for the poet, and his father have moved to Chicago after the death of his mother. He finds Chicago lonely and with nothing for him. Then he finds the Branch Library and books of poems by Langston Hughes, and maybe a friend, a quiet but memorable first novel. Louisiana, she's 10, her grandma wakes her up in the middle of the night and says, they must get on the road now. Trying to outrun the family curse, they leave Florida and stop in Georgia due to a dental emergency, grandma's, and an empty wallet. Louisiana is stunned when grandma tells her they are never going home. Then grandma leaves her in the night. Now Louisiana uses all the cunning and craftiness she has to survive and find a home. Fortunately, her new friend, Burke Allen, is on her side while they try to undo her family's curse of sundering or coming apart. This all started in Elf Ear, Nebraska in 1910. Louisiana's great-grandfather, a magician, sawed her great-grandma in half and then left, didn't put her back together again. That started the curse her grandma believes in, and Louisiana must break it so that she can have a home. With a white mother and a black father, who are now divorced, Isabella, 11, feels like she is pieces rather than a whole. Each Sunday, they all meet at the mall for Isabella to be exchanged and spend the next week with the other parent. This is unsettling to her as well. The chapters alternate between a week with her mom and a week with her dad. Along this is a racially biased event near the end of the book, being stopped by police when she was going for ice cream with her soon-to-be stepbrother, who is black. The police say they can go, and then Isabella takes her phone out of her pocket to call her parents, and she is shot. And soon she is in the hospital recovering. Coyote 12 travels with Rodeo, her father, but don't call him that, in a refitted old school bus. They go where whim takes them and only think of the future. One day when Coyote talks to her grandma, she learns the park in their old neighborhood is going to be leveled to become housing. Now Coyote must get home. Somewhere Rodeo will not go, so she will trick him into it. She must retrieve the memory box that she, her sisters, and mom buried in the park five years ago. Her, her sisters and mom have passed away from a ac car accident. They are in Florida. Her and her dad are in Florida right now and need to get what, to Washington, to Washington State in four days. And they have to do that without Rodeo realizing where they're going. Along the way, they give some other travelers a lift and an interesting fellowship develops. She finds a kitten who is unusually quiet and seemingly knowing about what humans need, a little bit like Coyote herself. 
and they help these other people and they also take on a considerate goat named Gladys. It's heartfelt and full of fun too and this book is able to move from silly to touching and to bringing a tear to your eye. It is aimed at upper elementary to early middle school readers or for anyone who enjoys a good road trip. Noah, 12, is in a wheelchair after the car accident that injured him and killed his father. He is not motivated to try in, his, in physical therapy. He was a good catcher for his baseball team, but now that's out. He is seeing a therapist whose unfailing cheerfulness irritates him. Then a new kid arrives at school. He is large, good-natured, and really doesn't pick up on social clues. He latches on to Noah and things begin to change. Well written and provides insight into adapting to major changes, loss, and bullying. This is book one in a new series by Danielle Jose Older. It is 1863 and dinosaurs exist. And they are trained for pulling wagons and things like that. Magdalus Roca is one of a number of orphans living at the Colored Orphan Asylum in New York City. On their way to the theater, Magdalus discovers that she can ask the dinosaur pulling their wagon to stop, hurry, or turn, just using her mind, not speaking. This is new for her. That night, the orphanage burns down. The theater burns while the audience and performers are still in it. They escape, thanks to Magdalus and a dinosaur, and they learn that they will soon be sold to the South as slaves. Thus begins a difficult conflict conflict between the two factions. Magdalus finds it hard to work with a team. She has been a loner for so long. Lots of intrigue, dinosaurs, and right versus wrong. It's a good start to this new series. Oh, here's another book that's going to be on my summer reading list. This is great fun. Max is an apprentice to a troubadour, his uncle Budrick, who is terrible, but he wants to be a knight. Joining up with some other kids and a bumbling wizard, Max tries her best, yes, her, we find out, to fulfill the prophecy that a young lady will save the kingdom of Bijovia from the evil usurper, King Ghastly. Full of cartoon-like illustrations to enhance the fun, and there, there will likely be more from the Midnights in the future. Speaking of knights and dinosaurs, here we go. Another book for next, year, next summer. The Knights of the Round Table have round table have been making up stories of their most recent recent adventures since dragons and dark knights are few and far between to teach them a lesson merlin sends them back to the time of the dinosaurs to face off with some real even vicious beasts and they have their work cut out for them humorous with some danger and plenty of illustrations will appeal to readers knights versus monsters came out may 7th but i haven't seen it yet so you might want to look into that one as well Life is harsh in Chani's teeming streets, so when runaway sisters Viji and Ruku arrive, their prospects look grim. Very quickly, 11-year-old Viji discovers how vulnerable they are in this uncaring, dangerous world. Her older sister Ruku has, um, is not a mentally co competent girl, but she loves to do things like make beaded bracelets. So Viji wants to take good care of her. Fortunately, the girls find shelter and friendship on an abandoned bridge with two homeless boys, Muthi and Aru. They form a family of, of types, but there is always trouble and danger. They spend their time going to the uh, city's different trash heaps and scavenging things that they can sell back to earn enough to buy food. They do like it because, after all, they are now the bosses of themselves and no longer dependent on untrustworthy adults. But when illness strikes, with, it hits her sister Ruku, she has to decide whether to risk seeking help from strangers or trying to hang on to their freedom, and she makes a tough decision. Jacqueline Woodson has written a, a wonderful book about sharing, really. Um, six kids in school, they're in sixth grade, are taken by their teacher to a room, a separate room, Bring your stuff with you. You're going to be here for the last hour of, of the day every Friday. And this is the art room, A-R-T-T, -T, which is short for a room to talk. That all, she's not going to stay. Nobody's going to be listening. It's just for them to talk with each other and to kind of work through some things. They discover it's safe to talk about what's bothering them. Deep, uh, everything from Esteban's father's deportation and Haley's father's incarceration 
to Amari's fears of racial profiling and Ashton's adjustment to his changing family fortunes. When the six are together, they can express the feelings and fears they have to hide from the rest of the world. And together, they can grow braver and more ready for what else is in store for them. It's beautifully written. Some nonfiction. I only have one so far. And this is great fun. Uh, this is a picture book biography of Yogi Berra aimed at more at grades two to five than picture book generally readers are. His family called him Lottie, but he became Yogi after some of his friends saw a movie with a Yogi sitting cross-legged, just like y y Lottie always did. It contains uh, highlights of his life, um, some stats, some Yogi-isms, and the fact that not all of those phrases that attributed to him actually came from him. As the author noted, he says in his own words, I really didn't say everything I said, which is great. And she does talk at the back of the book how she determined what one she would use in the book that are pretty likely attributed to him. Some fiction for younger teens. Oh, I'm moving along good. Um, Ellie, Ma Ellie Magari just learned that her mother is dead. Ellie is 14. Perhaps that would upset her if she had ever known her mother, but her mother left when she was very young and she doesn't remember anything about her at all. But in a way that makes it harder for her because now she always had in her mind that someday she'd go find her mom and, and meet up and, and learn what she's like. But now she'll never have that chance. So she goes, she has some hard times while she works through her loss and some puzzlement about how she can miss someone she doesn't even remember. But helpful, sympathetic friends, old and new, and they help her find her heart and make her peace with where things are now. Very well written. This is a companion full color graphic novel to Awkward and Brave. This is again taking place in the same middle school we've been before. Here the focus is on Jorge who slowly begins to realize he is off kilter around Jasmine because he likes her. It's a new experience for him. Jorge is big so no one messes with him and he patrols the halls between classes to step in when needed. He is also kind and thoughtful and he really is um, not sure what to do about this crush and how to um, talk to Jasmine. This is a graphic novel told in alternating times of now and then. The authors and illustrators tell of brothers Kwame, Kwame and Ibo, Ibo is 12, and their hopes for a new better life in Europe. This is told from Ibo's point of view. When he woke up in the morning his older brother Kwame had already left their village on the bus. Ibo follows, hoping to find him in the city of Aga, Agadez in Niger. They fortunately find each other and face hardships, some life-threatening on their way to a better life. Not everyone makes it. Jordan Banks, who loves drawing, is new to the Riverdale Academy Day School and discovers he is one of only a few people of color in the seventh grade. This school is much larger and more confusing than his previous school. Finding friends and his way is difficult especially with some students and teachers who are less than aware of their troubling viewpoints. As Booklist says, this remarkably honest and accessible story is not just about being new, it's unabashedly about race. Because one of the, the um, gym teachers calls a, a African-American student by a name of another African-American student. And that student has been there for years and still he hasn't paid attention to learn his real name, who he is. As Kirkus notes, this is a book for every middle school. Theodore Trace Carter, he's in middle school, and he now lives with his Aunt Leah since the death of his parents in a car accident. Moving from Baltimore to Brooklyn, missing his parents, though his aunt is wonderful, and now he is reliving the accident in his dreams every night. It leaves him off kilter. But now, it looks like he's seen a ghost. And though he can at first quite believe he has, he soon discovers that the boy he sees in the New York Public Library has ties to Trace's own history, and that Trace may be his connection to settling the dead to rest. Eddie Youngblood is 13, and he is now in a coma fighting for his life. He was in the first um, week of football practice for the high school, he's or a middle schooler, 
and at the, the last day, the Friday of the class, as you, as you read the story, you begin to learn these things. They're in bits and pieces as you go along. The, the seniors have a tradition of making the freshman kids work hard and, and pummel each other and seemingly all in good fun, but his injury happened during this event. So was it an, an inevitable result of playing a violent sport or was there something more sinister on the field that day? Was there, um, oh gosh, what's it called? I don't have the word down for they, oh, har harassment. You hear Teddy's inner thoughts in there told in brief snippets. Explore, Game Changer, uh, Amazon says, Game Changer explores the joyous thrills and terrifying risks of America's most popular sport. This is a full color graphic novel and Faith is just starting middle school and she's already worried about how she will fit in. She is thrilled when Amanda, the most popular eighth grader, talks to her directly and convinces her to join the school soccer team. Well, if Amanda will be my friend, yes, I'll do that. But she finds out because she's never played before, she's going to be on the C team and Amanda's on the A team. But this group of other girls on her team, as she gets to know them, none of them are any good at soccer, but they're all pretty good at being friends. And that is more important to her anyway. At first, the book's kind of confusing, and I, I felt like they did that because that's how Faith was feeling as she started middle school. But it, it begins to um, come together and make more sense, and maybe that's how Faith found her way, too. Oh, Gordon Corman, how can this be bad? <laughs> In this school, there is one room where uh, that no one goes to except the kids who are incorrigible. They are misfits, delinquents, and academic train wrecks. They are in room 117, and this year their teacher is Mr. Zachary Kermit. He is the most burnout teacher in the whole school system. And this is all because of a cheating scandal from like 20 years ago, but still that shattered his faith in teaching and in students and, and parents. But now, He's one year away from retirement. If he can finish this school year, then he can retire early and be done with school and be set for the rest of his life. However, the superintendent has no intention of letting him complete the school year. In this way, he begins to see that he needs to connect with the students and the students begin to respond to some of the things he's doing. It's um, a, a typical Gordon Corman book, great fun and unusual circumstances. Brian is in sixth grade. He has an older sister, Ava, and his parents have been encouraging him to become a good friend to Mike, who um, he kind of knows, but not very well. And what happens is the things that his parents don't know are that Mike has a tendency towards delinquency and getting into trouble, but he manages to not get caught. And so Brian's torn. He knows that some of the things that, that Mike is getting him to do really aren't good ideas, but he's still kind of stuck on that, ooh, I, I kind of liked doing this, and also, but my parents said I should be his friend. But then Mike does a couple of things that are really not good for Brian. Another part of the story is that his father has anger issues, not with his family, but he does use his fists when angry at other people or when feeling put down, and Brian is headed that way. He has a temper tantrum on occasion, and his mom is very worried about what will happen down the line. It's a well-pulled-together story, and um, things come out in the end the way you hope they will, but he has a tough time there for a while. This is kind of creepy, and you know, I'm not good with creepy, but ooh, in the attic of the old house, oh, I, let me start. De Denise Farber and her mom and her new stepdad have just moved back to um, New Orleans after they left from Hurricane Katrina and they've been in Texas in the meantime. But now they've moved back and her mom and stepdad have bought this house that's all falling apart practically and, and everything needs to be fixed, but they want to turn it into a bed and breakfast. Well, um, Denise was okay with moving back to New Orleans, but she doesn't have any friends 
the people that she encounters are kind of um, standoffish to her. And also the house has two ghosts that she learns more about as she as she goes along. And that's mostly because she finds a mysterious comic book in the attic tucked wrapped in several layers of plastic tucked back in the attic. And the, it appears that there's one ghost who's pretty friendly and one ghost who is very angry. So she has to figure out what to do about these ghosts and will they be able to stay in their house. Carter Jones answers the door one morning and is astounded to find a butler standing there. And that butler, he's an Engli a real English butler, is there to help the family. His father has passed away and things are kind of falling apart. And the butler has definite ideas of how things should be done and when. And it's kind of hard on, on Carter, but the other part of this story is that the butler is happy to teach the kids how to play cricket. And so there are cricket-related terms. The chapters will define a cricket term at the beginning and then go into the story. And the kids are really kind of keen on this. And actually, the football team, who's supposed to have the field to practice, are kind of intrigued about it too. So um, we go along learning about Carter and his life and how things are adjusting. The things that the English butler will do for the family and cricket. It's quite fun. Jimmy is 13 and his cousin has passed away. His cousin was 13 also. And the trouble is he has to wear last year's suit, last year's dress pants, which are too tight and he's afraid things are going to rip. But also he finds out that his mother tells him he has to say some words at the funeral the next day and he is flabbergasted because he can't remember one good thing that his cousin ever did with him. His cousin was a, a, a fun spoiler and a stinker and too caught up in himself. And Jimmy's just, he can't come up with anything to say about his cousin. As he, um, as he goes through all of this, he is pondering all along. Well, I could talk about this time when we did this, but then that'll be like a sentence and a half, and then things went bad after that, so should I even bring it up? And he's really thinking through all of the experiences he had with his cousin and why things never seem to be good. But it isn't until he's faced with the microphone, as, and this is a quote from Amazon, that the realization finally hits him. It's not the words that are spoken that matter the most, but the words that are truly heard. And he has something to say, and it's amazing. Mads is pretty happy with her life. She goes to church with her family, and, and um, she and her dad go to minor league baseball games when they can. She goose off her best friend, Kat, is just great fun. And her next door neighbor, Adam, kind of likes her, but she doesn't want to kiss him, and she doesn't want to, you know, get romantically involved. And then one day she realizes she really wants to kiss Kat, not the boy next door. And so we, we go through this part of her life where she has kisses one through eight and how she discovers who she really is. This is a, a graphic novel in black, white, and gray. Some nonfiction for teens. I just have one. This is by Lori Hall Sanderson, and she has written a, a poetry memoir. And this is a true truth about when she was raped at 13 and her life after that. And she um, calls people out, or she calls, well, well, let, me, let me see how it's put here. Uh, Amazon says, searing and soul searching. It is a denouncement of our society's failures and a love letter to all the people with the courage to say, me too. And you get some relief in there because she spends a year in Norway, I think it was. And that is wonderful, a wonderful experience for her. And that time is great. And then she comes back and she's kind of back in our culture and our um, blaming and et cetera. It's hard to read, but it's very good. So I would call this for high school students and older at, at, and not for every collection. A few fiction for older teens. 
Where am I? Oh, yeah. This book is about ghosts. Adele can see the dead, but only they're all tethered to the place where they died. So they don't like float around and follow her. But when she'll walk along, she might see someone where the, the car ran off the road and they died. Um, and she's been taking medication for years to keep that from happening because when she was younger and told her mom about it or her grandpa about it, he was appalled and wanted to be sure. He says, you're making that up. It's all not true. Let's get you to the doctor. Well, she stopped taking her medication and now she sees her a friend from school, Tori, who is dead in the woods of the park and she's been killed there and she has to stay there until her, the body is moved to the morgue and then she sees her at the morgue. Um, Adele becomes a prime suspect in her murder because she was at this party. She doesn't usually drink, but at this party she, she drank too much and she had, um, she hit up the blackout drinking level, which they learned about in school and they talk about that in the book. And she begins to think, maybe I did kill her. Maybe I was at, mad at her. Maybe this is all true. But she, um, she finds out the truth by the end of the book. It's been three years since the school's shooting at the Virgil County High School. And there's a story about one of the victims who, um, when a girl outside heard a girl in the bathroom say that, proclaiming her Christian faith. But Leanne Bauer was there. She was in the bathroom with the girl who died and knows that that didn't happen. It was a different girl whose, whose um, cross necklace was torn off of her and tossed aside. Now she's trying to decide three years later the girl who had spoken up and said, no, that was my necklace, was, was shunned out of town. And now um, Leanne is trying to decide, should I, should I speak up now? Because the family's going to write a book about this whole thing. So you hear that you have the annual gathering of the five, there are six that were in the line of fire and did not get killed. The one who left town and so the other five get together every year on the anniversary of that date and they do not go to school. They go into the woods and, and spend the time together because they just can't go to school on that day. It's a hard story, but it's also a liberating story about moving ahead. And this, this is their senior year of high school. So next year they'll all go to college and they'll all be somewhere else and they won't be able to get together on that day. So what will they do? Another hard book. This is one of the 25 titles on the 2019 teens top 10 list. And I happened to pick it up and read it. And it's gruesome. It's not really for me, but it is well written and compelling. Dee was quickly convicted and sentenced for her stepsister's murder. Now she has been sent to Alcatraz 2.0 run by the postman, which was supposed to be only for the most heinous of criminals. So why is she here? She will eventually be, the, the whole plan is that eventually everyone sent there is killed by one of several sanctioned killers to, that carry out the sentence. It's all shown on a pay TV channel on television. Each killer has his or her own persona and torture is allowed. Inmates cannot harm each other, that's not allowed, or your family members might suffer. They must wait for their turn with one of the killers. It's all to entertain the masses while their sentences are carried out, except D did not kill Monica. How can she prove it and get out of here? There is no way out, everybody tells her. Okay, this is on a completely different note. This is more like small town high school regular stuff. <laughs> Sophie and her band friends are involved in, in fundraising over the summer before her senior year in order to pay for the band trip to perform in the Rose Parade. Sophie has the idea to ask country singing star Megan Pleasant to perform at a fundraising event since Megan lived in, Arcade, in Acadia when she won the Next Country Star TV Shows contest. Unfortunately, Megan has made it clear she will never return. Along with everything else, Sophie has fun spending time with August, the new guy in town, though she is avoiding any romantic type of behavior as she believes that she is asexual. And finally, she tells him that. And they decide that they'll just, they're, it's too early for anything else anyway, so let's just spend time together, which is a nice 
moment in the book and at that time in their lives. Sa Sally? Yes. It's, it's about five oh, after. Okay. I have two more books. I can be really, really fast. Good deal. We okay. want to have some time for some questions if there are any. So. Okay. Fine. I'll be real quick. These, these next two books are volume one and volume two so far in a full color graphic novel series. Nicholas Cox is the illegitimate son of retired fencing champion, and he is determined to earn a place on King's Rose School's fencing team, though he has a long way to go to prove himself. His half-brother, half Jesse Cost, and prodigy Sejay Katayama will be challenging him to defeat or keep, even keep up with. And so the first book is all about trying to get into the school. And the second book is about the competitions so far of who's going to be on the team. And there are at least going to be five books in this series. And I, when I looked at these two, I thought, do these guys spend all their time looking fierce and mean because they're in competition? But it's, it's compelling and it's all about fencing and how you move and how you can win your matches. And it was intriguing to me. So I think that kids interested in different kinds of sports might pick this up. It's full color graphic novel, as I think I said. And there we are. So. Well, let me open everybody up that can. Okay. Any questions from anybody? It's like there's a couple of chat questions. Well, oh. oh, okay. I didn't even look there. I'm sorry, Eric. <laughs> I was busy chatting. <laughs> They're talking. I do want to say that we have put this, uh, uh, Eric sent out the PDF of the book list to everyone, and we also put it up on our um, Nebraska Library Commission webpage. If you search handouts and then click on handouts, um, click on the top thing that comes up, you'll see that page of all my handouts. And this is now the top list. So if you're not sure what happened to your email, you can always find it on the commission webpage. Okay. Um, any questions from anybody? Um, either up or uh, uh, hang on a second. Uh, Jenny, I think that's you. Let's, I'm trying to unmute, unmute you, Mike. Unmute your mic. It's not working, Jenny. Okay. There you go. Oh. What's up? I didn't have a question. I just, oh. I, I muted it because oh, okay. I didn't have a question. Okay. Right. Well, if there's no questions, then we'll call it, um, close the recording and close the session. Thank you, Sally, for your, uh, for your book list. Um, we'll talk with you all later. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I sure had a good time. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally. Bye-bye.